Dorothy looked at her husband with surprised eyes. Barry, are you serious right now? His dark eyes sparkled mysteriously. Absolutely. And I'm sure you'll love our plan with the boys. Barry replied. Dorothy smiled. Their eldest son, Nick, turned 30 last month. And the younger one, Todd, would soon be 27. Still, Barry continued to call them the boys. Both sons were married, and gatherings had become rare lately. Now, a wonderful occasion had emerged. Dorothy's anniversary. But why did he choose such an unusual place? Pondering this, Dorothy furrowed her brow again. Barry, I still don't understand why you thought I'd agree to this adventure. I love the mountains, but only in the summer when it's sunny and green. You know, remember our last trip? It was a real miracle. Dorothy, dear, mountains are wonderful any time of the year. Barry mused, looking out the window. Imagine snow-cupped peaks, the snow glistening in the sun like diamond dust, and the incredible crisp, clean, frosty air. Trust me, you won't regret it, Barry. But I don't know how to ski, and it's too late for me to learn at my age. Don't you understand? Dorothy bit her lip. Maybe you are tired of me, and you just want to get rid of me, ha. Huh? Lived 50 years, and that's enough. Is that it? Barry looked at his wife and laughed. Come on, Dorothy. It's never too late for skiing. Didn't expect you to underestimate yourself so much. You're my smart, beautiful girl, and you'll always be young. Anyway, I promise to love you until death do us part. So, not much longer to wait. It seems, Dorothy laughed. Listen, maybe you've found a replacement for me decided to kill two birds with one stone. Ha, huh, you're mistaken. Barry put on a serious face. Not two birds, just one cowardly bard. Pretending to be angry, Dorothy slapped her husband on the shoulder, but he dodged it and immediately hugged her, then kissed her on the lips. Well, you two are just like children. Came the voice of their elder son Nick from the doorway. Yeah, nodded Todd appearing with bulky packages in hand. Wish we had that energy at your age. Dorothy laughed in response and playfully threw a small pillow at her sons. Oh, you rascals. Instead of congratulating me on my birthday, you remind me of my age. Dear, pay no attention. Barry smiled. These two are just envious. Dorothy didn't say anything to her husband, heading towards her sons, whom she had missed so much. Boys, Wash your hands. I'll set the table. And please, no arguing. I won't let you go anywhere without lunch. Besides, we need to discuss this strange trip you've decided to organize for me, Dad. Todd turned to his father. You said it would be a surprise, and Mom would find out everything on the spot. Well, I had to tell her. Barry shrugged. After all, she needs to pack, and I have no clue about that. Imagine, in an evening gown on a snow-covered mountain slope. She'd look stunning. But silly, don't you think? The family lunch was coming to an end. After discussing the details of the upcoming trip, they agreed to meet on Saturday morning. When you arrive, we'll already be there, said Nick. Brooke and I will pick up Todd and Molly. We want to get there early, explore, and get prepared. You guys come as planned. Okay, well... That sounds great, nodded Barry. It's really nice when kids are so grown up and independent. Seeing off their sons, Barry went about his business, and Dorothy lay down on the couch, grabbing a new novel she had recently bought at a small bookstore. She was an avid reader, and over the years, reading had become a necessity for her. She enjoyed following the fates of the characters. Books were Dorothy's loyal and intelligent companions with whom she could argue, agree, believe, or not. The plot of this novel was simply banal. The husband of the main character had a young and beautiful lover. The once strong marriage now had a crack. Sympathizing with the deceived woman, she thought about her husband. What if something similar happened to their family? She and Barry had lived together for many years, their souls intertwined. He always took care of her and was attentive in every way. 
Yes, Dorothy was confident in the solidity of their marriage, in her beloved man, in herself, about 89%, and in Barry, a whole 200%. Why 89% in herself? She gave 10% to her romanticism, and 1% she kept just in case she went crazy. And only that 1%, in her opinion, could shatter their family. Barry, as Dorothy fought, was as reliable as a locomotive steadily moving forward, never derailing from the tracks. And Dorothy was the stoker in this locomotive. Barry led and looked ahead through the stations, while she tossed coal into the furnace, being a faithful wife and keeper of the home hearth. Dorothy stood up and worked to the mirror, for her age. She looked quite good. She was of short stature, slender, and toned. Of course, there were wrinkles. The skin had lost its elasticity long ago, and fatigue more often made itself felt. And then there were these dizzy spells. Dorothy didn't talk to her husband about them, but she herself increasingly thought that she needed to see a doctor. I'm only 50, she thought, looking at her reflection. Health problems have already started. Dizziness. Will it only get worse from here? Come on, Dorothy. Stop it, Dorothy. Pull yourself together. Barry is right. There's no need to act like an old woman. You have another 10, maybe 20 years ahead. Look, life is still ahead of you. If at 40, everything is just beginning. At 50, it only continues. So stop being gloomy, my dear. What mistresses could your husband have? Barry is not like that. Their love is exceptional. There is no other like it. It's a gift from heaven. Your beloved husband is at an age now where anything can be expected from him. Molly's words came to mind. They had been friends with Dorothy for many years, and she brought up this conversation unexpectedly, catching Dorothy off guard at the time. Dorothy, it's precisely at this age that men's heads spin, and they fall for younger girls. Molly said, don't talk nonsense. Dorothy protested. I wouldn't be so confident if I were you. Molly's voice sounded from afar, shaking off unpleasant thoughts. Dorothy returned to the couch and continued reading, attentively following the fates of the characters. Barry silently cracked open the bathroom door and watched her. He was always charmed and impressed by the meticulous and obligatory preparation of women for encounters with city streets, as if with a precious lover, strand by strand, nail polish, a gentle fragrance of perfume. My girl, how much I love you. How much I regret not knowing about you earlier. My dear, I'm so happy you came into my life. You can't imagine how thrilled I am. He thought she raised her tired but clear eyes to him. When will we meet again, Barry? Sorry, only next week, he said, kissing the girl on the forehead. Dorothy, I'm leaving with the family to the mountains. We'll only be back on Monday. Okay, why are you upset? Don't be please. And she trustingly pressed against his shoulder. You know, I'm so happy when you're around. We'll be together, won't we? You'll never leave me, right? Never. Barry brushed away a stray strand of hair that had fallen on Dorothy's face. Someday we'll be together. Do you believe that? I do. She nodded. Strong hands pulled her closer. And she, she had no intention of resisting. In this unknown book of destinies, Days and hours are set, minutes are allotted for joy and sorrow, illness and suffering, meetings and partings are predetermined. Dorothy, without noticing it, fell asleep with the book in her hands and had a rather strange dream. She was walking somewhere without paying attention to the road. A dense fog enveloped her, and somewhere nearby, footsteps could be heard. Whose they belonged to, whether an animal or a human, she didn't know but the steps were soft and almost silent. Suddenly, the fog abruptly dispersed, and Dorothy saw that she was on top of a mountain, standing on the very edge of a cliff. The ice sparkling in the sun blinded her, and she realized with horror that there was nothing around her at all. Nothing but this snowy silence. She was afraid to take a step because she could easily stumble. Behind her, footsteps were heard again, Dorothy wanted to scream but couldn't. 
A heavy, dark oppression began to rise to her throat and gathered there like a lump that couldn't be spit out or swallowed. The steps were getting closer. Frightened, she couldn't bait and turned around. In the next second, Dorothy plunged down into a deep, dark abyss, and the icy cold breath of the abyss touched her face. Startling, Dorothy woke up and sat on the couch. Her heart was pounding wildly. A dream. It's just a dream. She thought with relief. At that moment, Barry entered the room. Seeing his wife's frightened eyes, he sat down beside her and took her hand. What's wrong, dear? What happened? He asked. Nothing. She smiled in response. I just dozed off and had an unpleasant dream. I don't even want to remember it. Listen, let's have some tea instead. I feel a bit tired, Barry suggested. Is everything okay with you? Dorothy softly asked. You seem a bit strange. Don't worry, everything is fine. Barry reassured her, gently caressing her cheek. So, how about some tea? The trip was still a few days away. But the uneasy feeling that had settled in Dorothy's soul wouldn't let her rest. To avoid upsetting her men, she made every effort to pretend that nothing was happening and that she was genuinely looking forward to the upcoming vacation. Yet, deep in her heart, a sharp needle of fear reminded her of its presence. In the air, the scent of change was sharp and persistent. Dorothy cautiously sniffed trying to determine the direction and strength of the wind. Eventually, Dorothy couldn't hold back any longer. She dialed her sister's number. Joan was 15 years younger than Dorothy, and their parents never expected to have another daughter at their age. When Dorothy's mother experienced health issues, her father insisted that she go to the hospital. The doctor diagnosed a fibroid, a word that frightened both her parents and Dorothy. She vividly remembered those few days when her parents acted strangely. Eventually, her father couldn't bait. I'll take you to a good hospital tomorrow. Let them take another look and prescribe treatment. When they returned, their faces were so bewildered that Dorothy was deeply scared. She thought her mother was seriously ill. But her mother just shrugged when she asked. You'll have a little brother or sister. Oh, Harry. What do we do now? Dorothy's father chuckled cheerfully, remembering what and how to do when a little child appears in the family. What else? And Dorothy will always help. Right. So, dear, don't worry. We'll manage. Despite the significant age difference, Dorothy and Joan were close, never hiding anything from each other, trusting one another. Joan, hi, how are you doing there? Everything's fine. Dorothy, living like a button, Joan reported, woke up and found myself in a loop. She had recently divorced her husband and was getting used to a new reality. Their marriage lasted for 10 years, filled with both joys and sorrows, just like any other. Well, not exactly like any other. They didn't have children. With the other girl, Bill made a choice, not in favor of Joan. She didn't resist the divorce, as the guilt towards her beloved husband had haunted her all these years. Joan, I, I really want you to come to us, Dorothy said. After all, you need to unwind. It's my anniversary, and you can't deny me the joy of seeing you. Where will you be celebrating? Joan inquired. In a restaurant. Will there be many guests? You'll be surprised. Honestly, I'm a bit puzzled myself. We'll be celebrating in the mountains. The boys rented a house there. I wanted to invite you. So, what do you think? Joan, listen, Dorothy, but that's just wonderful. The beauty in the mountains is unreal. I can imagine a cozy living room, a fireplace, champagne in glasses, candles, and outside, Dorothy, breathtaking landscapes, Joan, Will you come? Dorothy asked thoughtfully. Well, I really want to, but I won't promise. So, little sister, I don't know. Recent events have thrown me off balance, but I'll try. I'll still be waiting for you. Joan heard something unusual in her sister's voice, like an unspoken concern. Dorothy, something happened to you. 
You seem a bit down, Joan. I'm afraid. And what I'm afraid of, I don't even know. Some strange premonition bothers me. It always feels like something is about to happen. And then there's this trip to the mountains, Dorothy said, looking up at the ceiling. Actually, I wanted to celebrate in a restaurant, but Barry decided otherwise. And, of course, the boys supported him. Now I'm at a loss, and completely in vain, Joan said. You should be happy. You have a family that loves and appreciates you. Believe me, it's much worse when it's the other way around. I understand. But it's this feeling of anxiety. Joan, don't think about the bad. Remember, when I was 15, I fell in love with that boy. What was his name? Garon. Right, the tone of her sister's voice warmed. We didn't part for three years. Then he moved to another city with his parents forever. You told me then that we should believe only in the good. And then, that good will definitely happen. Do you really remember Garon? Dorothy smiled. I remember. Joan sighed. Especially his eyes. I could recognize him among a thousand other men. Sometimes I feel like he was that kind of love that comes to a person only once in a lifetime. But you were just a child then. So what, little sister? Do you still believe that you'll meet again someday? Dorothy asked after a pause. Well, to be honest, I stopped believing a long time ago. But you also have to believe only in the best. You know, especially since you have no reason to be sad. And you don't either. Dorothy exclaimed. So you and Bill divorced. In our time, no one is surprised by divorce. Life goes on. It's much worse. Joan sighed. We divorced. But yesterday, imagine, he came to me again. He was drunk. And what does he want? Dorothy wondered. He wanted us to start all over again. Wait, little sister. But there's a child there. Dorothy exclaimed. If he didn't want to leave you, why did he need all this? Oh, Dorothy, you haven't seen his wife. Some people are like a swamp. They suck everything in. So he got tired, finally realized what he lost. Joan bitterly smirked. So what did you decide? Dorothy, you know me. I kicked him out and told him not to show up again. That's it. The sisters talked for over an hour, and Joan managed to dispel all the worries of her elder sister, Barry. I invited Joan. Dorothy told her husband during dinner. I think the trip will do her good. Yes, you did the right thing. I was actually planning to call Joan and invite her to join us. Barry replied. Dorothy smiled at Barry. Joan is right. I'm very lucky to have you, my dear husband. And I'm lucky to have you, dear. Barry smiled. What can I say? Listen to your younger sister. She won't lead you astray. Their conversation was interrupted by a phone call. Dorothy picked up the receiver, Brooke. She immediately recognized Brooke's voice, the wife of their eldest son. Hello, dear, how are you? Everything's fine, Dorothy. Thanks. Can you tell me if Nick is with you? I can't reach him. Well, they came together with Todd, had lunch, and left. Ah, I see. Well, I hope he'll be back soon. Goodbye, Dorothy. Yes, it was nice to hear from you, Brooke. And here's Nick. I worried for nothing. Brooke said before ending the call. Well, that's good. Dorothy smiled. See you on the weekend. Brooke placed the phone on the table and turned to her husband. Her eyes shooting sparks. Why didn't you tell me you'd be having lunch at your parents? Because I didn't know myself. Nick calmly said taking off his shoes in the hallway. Todd and I stopped by my parents for a moment and didn't plan to stay. But mom insisted. You know how hospitable she is. And she cooks amazingly. So you mean I cook poorly? Tears suddenly glistened in Brooke's eyes. Well, of course, you're unlucky with a wife like me. I can't do anything. Neither cook nor bad children. Nick frowned. Here we go again. Lately, Brooke had become unbearable. They had lived together for eight years, but all attempts by Brooke to get pregnant ended tragically. Pregnancies terminated early, 
and doctors couldn't understand why it kept happening. Brooke was deeply troubled by it. She knew how much Nick dreamed of having a son, and she couldn't forgive herself for their failures. She also feared that one day Nick would meet a woman who would give him a child, and then he would leave her. She sobbed. Their marriage was falling apart, and she didn't know what to do. Nick didn't want to understand her. Now he silently went to his room, leaving Brooke standing in the empty hallway. Nick, I was actually talking to you. Brooke, you know I don't like it when you talk to me in that tone. And I don't like scandals at all. They always happen for no reason, constantly. If you want to talk, better tell me if you've packed for the trip. In response, Brooke burst into tears. Why aren't you interested in whether I want to go anywhere at all? Did you even want to ask me about it? Ha. Huh. I do understand that you're used to fulfilling all of Dorothy's requests. But what's that got to do with me? Maybe I wanted to spend this weekend entirely differently. But does anyone care? Why are you looking at me like that? Brooke suddenly noticed the expression on his face. I love you very much. Brooke, Nick replied. Understand, it's not just mom's birthday. It's her jubilee and she deserves kind attention. Unfortunately, I can't leave you at home because we agreed that each would come with their family. My family is you, Brooke, so we need to go together. Unfortunately, Brooke exclaimed, so you didn't even want to go with me. That's fantastic news. Dear, my husband, unfortunately, can't leave me at home. What a pity that you have to take me with you. Wow, Nick approached his sobbing wife and hugged her shoulders. What's happening to you? I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean it that way. Please stop. I really want you to come with me, you know. I really want that. We'll have a great time, and I don't want to see anyone but you, Brooke. Just please don't speak ill of my mom. I've never allowed anyone to do that. Besides, she treats you very well. You know, Brooke hid her tearful face on his shoulder. Nick, I'm sorry. I, I don't even know what's wrong with me. Maybe it's just fatigue. It's been building up. It's so hard for me. You can't imagine. I prepared lunch for you. And you, well, that's wonderful. Nick smiled. If there's lunch, then we won't have to cook dinner. Want to go to a movie or just take a work in the evening? Brooke lifted her head and looked into her husband's eyes. No, let's stay home. I don't want to go anywhere. Well, home is home. Nick embraced his wife. It's even better that way. After all, we need to get some rest before the trip. The two-story wooden house, surrounded by snow-white pines and firs, enchanted Dorothy, and she looked at her husband with happy eyes. Barry. I didn't imagine it would be so beautiful here. This is not all the surprises, her husband said and smiled. As far as I understand, the guys are already there. Well, dear, are you ready? And indeed, as soon as Barry finished speaking, the windows of the house and the entire porch lit up with bright yellow lights. It's like a fairy tale. Dorothy exclaimed. She waved cheerfully to her sons and daughters-in-law who came out to meet them. My dear ones, thank you for this celebration. It's a wonderful birthday. I didn't expect such splendor. I thought it would be different. And you, did you rent an entire cottage? But it must be very expensive. Guys, not more expensive than you. Mom, both sons kissed their mother. Then, with hugs and congratulations, the daughters-in-law approached. Thank you so much. Oh my God. If only you knew how grateful I am to you. Dorothy repeated, wiping tears of joy. Well then, let's sit at the table. Everything is ready. Molly, Todd's wife, said. No one objected. And soon the whole family found themselves in a cozy living room with a fireplace and huge windows spanning the entire wall. Everyone congratulated Dorothy, shed impressions of the beauty of the local nature. While Barry, with laughter, recounted how she got scared upon realizing the height they had to climb. Mom, you used to be into mountaineering in your youth, right? At least I saw a photo, Todd asked. Son, Dorothy smiled. In my youth, 
The movie The Heights was very popular. Believe me, my dear boy, I haven't met anyone who, after watching that film, wouldn't want to visit the mountains someday. But, of course, I wasn't an exception. However, my mountaineering career ended barely starting. The carabiner unfastened, and I fell from a height, breaking a leg and a couple of ribs. The doctor said I got off easy, though it didn't feel that way to me at the time. By the way, it was during that trip that mom met me. Barry added, covering his wife's hand with his palm. I haven't watched that movie. Molly, Todd's wife, said thoughtfully. I haven't even heard of it, but that can't be. Dorothy shook her head. No, I won't argue that you haven't watched it, but you must have heard the songs. They are still sung. Right, Dorothy paused for a moment and then sang a few lines. Barry immediately picked it up, joined by Nick. The daughters-in-law looked at their mother-in-law with surprise, and no one expected she had such a pleasant voice. Everyone indeed knew the songs, so the dinner continued with impromptu karaoke. After lunch, the family went for a work, and only Brooke decided to stay in the house, citing fatigue. She said she wanted to rest a bit. Nick offered to stay with her, but Brooke just waved her hand. Go already. I can see you really want to spend time with the family. He kissed her and left, while Brooke picked up the phone and dialed a number. Yes, I'm here. I'm ready to do everything. When will you come? Okay, I'll be waiting. Then you'll pick me up from here. Yes, I understand. Okay. After finishing the call, she hung up and lay down again. Brooke never fell asleep. She lay there, thinking about something personal, and a smile never left her lips. Winter dusk crept in unnoticed, covering the house. Inside, the scent of lavender filled the air. The fireplace crackled with warmth, and coziness spread through the rooms. The women set the table, while the men took care of the sauna. The weather, as is often the case in the mountains, changed from wonderful and clear to damp and windy. Huge snowflakes began to blanket the surroundings, and very soon, the snow turned into icy rain. The windows lost their transparency, covered in ice, and the temperature outside dropped. Dorothy, glancing at the world clock, spoke up. With this weather, Joan surely won't make it to us. I really wanted my little sister to come. At this rate, the road will quickly turn into an ice rink and climbing to such a height will not be an easy task. Yeah, it looks like we shouldn't expect any guests, Barry replied. At that moment, there was a quiet knock on the door. Dorothy straightened up. It's Joan. I'll open it right away. Opening the door, she immediately stepped back, unable to hide her surprise. Before her stood a girl, about 25, trembling from the cold. In her hands, she held a small travel bag. Sorry for the trouble, the stranger cautiously said. I was heading for a vacation. There's a tourist base somewhere around here. My friends are staying there. But I got lost, and the car stalled. Had to leave it down there. Can I stay with you for the night? I'm afraid I won't find the base in such darkness. And my car, it seems, has turned into a snowdrift. More like an ice slide. Um, Nick chuckled. Dorothy gave her son a reproachful look. Yes, come in, of course, she said. We're here with family, but there's a place for you too. Nick and Todd hurried to escort the guest to the table, took her out aware, poured hot mulled wine, and offered a soft warm blanket, which she gladly draped over her shoulders. Brooke and Molly exchanged glances. The guest clearly didn't appeal to them and the attention their husbands paid to the stranger irritated the women. They hastened to take their seats next to their husbands, trying to show who belonged to whom. No one noticed the change in Bari's face since the appearance of the girl. He stood aside, not taking his eyes off her. His face reflected a whole range of emotions. Finally, gathering himself, he approached the table to take his seat. Barry, what are you standing still for? Dorothy addressed her husband. Meet. This is. She suddenly fell silent in confusion. Oh, 
and you haven't even said your name, Leslie. The girl replied, taking a sip of mulled wine. My name is Leslie, MMM, delicious, help yourself. My husband Barry makes this drink. I'm Dorothy. These are our sons, Nick and Todd. And these are their wives, Brooke and Molly. Pleasure to meet you. Leslie nodded and looked at Barry. Thank you very much. Wonderful mulled wine. It's called that, right? Yes, that's correct. He replied and, after a pause, added, It's strange that your friends left you alone in such a wilderness, Leslie. I would never do that to someone close to me. The girl smiled and waved her hand. They're used to it. I've always been independent and don't get lost even in the most challenging life situations. Yes, I've already figured that out. Barry said with a soft smirk. Since you didn't hesitate to wander alone in the middle of the night in an unfamiliar area, you really need a strong and brave character here. Mom often said I'm a spitting image of my father. The girl said and took another sip of mulled wine. And you probably should call her to let her know you're okay. Right. Dorothy said. Well, the thing is, my mom passed away five years ago. I'm alone. No family. No relatives. No one. And your father? Brooke asked. Well, that's complicated. She shook her head. And I know nothing about him. Although I won't deny, I've always missed having a father. Everyone fell silent, not knowing what to say. Brooke was the first to break the silence that hung in the living room. You have a bag with you. Perhaps you'd like to change. I could show you to an empty room. Yes, thank you. That would be wonderful. And you can warm up in the sauna. It's been ready for a while. Todd suggested, slightly wincing at the pinch his wife Molly gave him. With great pleasure, Leslie turned to him. Honestly, I'm very cold. And within a minute, she and Brooke worked into the only vacant room. And Leslie smiled, surveying the large bed. How wonderful it is here. Leslie ran her hand over the soft bedspread. Yes, probably. Brooke nodded and left, but she didn't return to the living room. Instead, Brooke went to the room she had chosen for herself and Nick. Approaching the window and opening it, heavy, cold drops were tapping on the windowsill. The freezing rain mixed with snow showed no signs of stopping. Brooke frowned. In such weather, carrying out her plan was very problematic. Leslie's arrival was also very inconvenient. Why did she come here? How did she manage to reach them alone at night? No, something was definitely wrong. Hearing footsteps on the stairs, Brooke tensed and hurried to close the window. As soon as she drew the curtains, her husband Nick entered the room. Brooke, what are you doing? We're in the living room. Everyone's waiting for you. Leslie has already joined. You know, she's such a funny and cheerful girl. Yeah, and here I am thinking you're staring at her. But you're just admiring her, right? Honey, Brooke, Nick raised an eyebrow. I don't understand. Are you jealous? You wish. She told him that was hotful. Brooke, what's going on with you? You're acting strange, acting strange, huh? I just don't intend to cling to someone who doesn't need me. That's it, Nick understood. An innocent conversation could escalate into a scandal again and he hurried to reassure his wife. Brooke, don't start. Everything is fine. Nothing is fine. She burst out. I want to go home. I want it right now. I don't like it here, and I'm scared. What? Nick didn't understand. We're all here, a family. Three healthy strong men. Whom are you afraid of? You always didn't care, Nick. Brooke waved her hand. Then let's go downstairs. Okay, the man said, unwilling to continue the conversation. Without waiting for an answer, he took her hand and led her into the living room, which was filled with noise and cheerful voices. And what about you? Dorothy asked Leslie, who was telling something about herself. Oh, nothing. I told him I wasn't going to marry someone who didn't appreciate me at all. I ran away right from the ceremony leaving him there with his mouth open in surprise. That's it. Molly turned to Brooke and Nick. Guys, 
you missed a lot. It turns out Leslie almost got married to a rich guy, but she found out he already has a wife and a child. Can you imagine? Amazing story. Brooke smiled. Hmm. Sounds a lot like a made-up fairy tale. Or some suspenseful movie. Barry commented. Leslie shrugged. I'm not making anything up. I'm telling it as it is. Where do you live? Todd asked. You don't seem like a city girl. Well, I was actually born and raised in a small town. So, you are not too far off. But does it really matter where a person is born? In a big city or a small village? Yes, you're right. It doesn't matter at all. The main thing is for a person to always remain human. Todd smiled at her. Listen, Barry spoke up. Why are you all ganging up on Leslie? Let her rest. After all, she traveled a long way to get here and must be very tired. Leslie, maybe you want to go to sleep. And we're all tired after a long and exhausting day. Yeah, probably. Dorothy nodded. Indeed, it's time for everyone to go to sleep. Let's hope the weather will improve by morning and we can enjoy our rest to the fullest. But what about Leslie? Molly unexpectedly asked. She needs to find her friends, but we have no idea where that base is and what it's called. And in the end, we only have one day left to relax in this wonderful place. I agree with Molly, Todd said. And I suggest you, Leslie, not to look for more adventures and spend tomorrow with us. On Monday, we'll take you to your car or if you want, to the town. Leslie glanced at everyone present and looked intently at Barry. What do you say, Barry? She asked, but he didn't have a chance to answer. Suddenly, all the lights in the house went out and the area surrounding the house was also left without illumination. What's happening? Dorothy exclaimed. Brooke grabbed her husband's hand. Yes, probably. The power lines broke due to the ice and wind. It happens quite often, explained the head of the family to everyone. I know where the generator is, though you need to go to the shed behind the house. Nick and I will handle it quickly. We just need to find a flashlight or candles. I saw a whole pack of candles, Molly said. Well, when I was preparing dinner, they are there, in the second drawer from the bottom. Matches are there too. Wait. I'll bring them. The woman headed for the kitchen set, extending her hands forward, bumping into sharp corners that appeared out of nowhere in the darkness. I'll light up now, Nick figured out, hastily taking his phone out of his pocket. And mine seems to be dead. Todd replied, I forgot to charge it. Mine is running out of battery too, said Nick's brother. But I think I can make it to the shed and deal with the generator. Okay. No need to go anywhere, interrupted their father. Anyway, everyone is going to bed. Let's take candles, and in the morning, we'll figure out the generator. Electrical work might be done for us. Barry added, Dad, we're quick. Nick began, but his father cut him off mid-sentence. Nick, I told you, there's no need. So, today let's go everyone, go to sleep. Good night, what about me? Leslie asked, realizing they forgot about her. Oh yes. Barry handed the girl a lit candle. If you want, you really can stay with us these days. I hope no one minds. Well, that's wonderful. Good night. And the living room emptied. All night, the wind howled outside the window. Dorothy, tossing and turning, couldn't fall asleep. She listened to her husband's steady breathing and thought about how fortunate it was to live her life with the person she loved. Dorothy suppressed a heavy sigh. Barry wasn't her first and only love, but she met him during the toughest period of her life and was grateful to fate for this encounter. Images from the past whirled before her eyes like flakes of wet snow that just wouldn't settle outside the window. Dorothy was always graceful and beautiful, poised in a way that set her apart from many other girls. She could charm and captivate anyone. Dorothy was among those women who never sought adventures on their own, but easily surrendered to anyone who could keep them. In reality, her story was simple and commonplace. She grew up in an ordinary rural family. 
Dorothy's father worked as a tractor driver, and her mother worked at the grain factory. There was no talk of wealth in their home. They lived like everyone else, neither worse nor better. They kept birds and livestock, tended to their own garden, and on weekends enjoyed going into the woods for berries. Considering it the best form of relaxation, they never dreamed of seas or other trips around the country, let alone the world. They believed their daughter should fully share their interests. So, they were surprised when Dorothy expressed her desire to enroll in the Institute for the Faculty of Physics and Mathematics. What is that? Her father frowned. Dad, it's where people who are good at mathematics study. I have no problems with this subject, and I find it interesting to learn. That's why I want to try myself in this institute. Dorothy explained. But I haven't seen any such institute in our city. Her father said. But I'll have to go to another city. I checked. I'll be living in a dormitory. I don't understand why you need all this. Harry, not finishing his soup, pushed the spoon aside. Who needs your mathematics now? Or do you want to be like our accountant? Everyone considers her a snake. She's used to counting other people's money and is always telling the boss that we should be paid less. Do you want to be like that? I don't understand. Dad, but it's different. His daughter tried to argue. I don't want to become an accountant. I enjoy calculations, computations, various important operations without which the progress of the entire country is impossible. Now you're reaching, huh? Her father shook his head markingly surveying Dorothy from head to toe. If you really want to be useful, fine, go to college. Just choose something more understandable. An agronomist, for example, or an animal scientist. The country you're talking about will always need to eat. It needs a lot of meat and milk. That's what I understand as useful. Not your mathematics. Dad, Dorothy decided to insist. You just don't understand the perspectives that open up for those who graduate from the physics and mathematics faculty. They are the future scientists, researchers, creators of something new. Harry slammed his hand on the table and stood up. I said no. It means no. The conversation is over. Dorothy turned to her mother, who was silently feeding her sister Joan. Mom, why are you silent? We worry about you, dear, her mother said. You know what the manners are like in these big cities. You're a decent, kind girl, and we are concerned for you. Everyone is rushing to the cities. What is this all about? When will it end? Well, yes, mom. Of course, it's better for me to stay here with you and milk cows until the end. Yes, Dorothy, and life should be unhurried, her mother said. Why do people flock to the cities? Many people chase dreams and hopes of elusive happiness and fleeting joys. Hum, mom, but I'm bored here. Do you think it will instantly become fun there, Dorothy? You'll regret everything. Look, Rory Tomas, the best combine operator in town, is already I knew. No, mom, I'd rather go to college. Dorothy sighed. No, you won't, her father shouted. Dorothy flinched. Her father had never yelled at her before, but dad, I've said it all. He interrupted and left the room. The mother watched her husband leave with a worried look. Don't be like that with dad, Dorothy. He loves you. And it will be very difficult for us if you leave. I have to go to work. You see, there's not enough money. And dad is nervous. Mom, it's not fair. You don't think about my future. You're only interested in what is now. But I don't want to stay in this village. I want to study. I want to live in a big city. Mom, don't you hear me? No, I don't hear, her mother said. I'll clear the table. You take Joan and put her to bed. And get these silly thoughts out of your head, please. It will be as your father said. Dorothy complied with her mother's request, but she didn't stop thinking about college. One night, she ran away from home leaving her parents a note asking them not to be angry. The noisy, big city, at first, didn't appeal to Dorothy. Everything was very unfamiliar. The train rumbled, clattering with its old wheels. 
Dirty, dusty wind blew through the open windows. She will return. She will return as soon as she has the opportunity. And she will definitely write to her parents. Dorothy did just that. But when she received a reply from home, she dropped the letter from her hands. Her father wrote for her to forget the way home, that they no longer have a daughter named Dorothy. Moreover, she can live as she wants. Her fate no longer concerns them. The heavy memories that came to Dorothy that night greatly disturbed her, and she didn't immediately notice that the breathing of Barry, who was sleeping next to her, had changed. She didn't want to wake her husband, so she pretended to be sound asleep. Barry listened for a while, then carefully getting up, but as soon as he stepped onto the wooden floor, the boards creaked under his feet. Barry, muttering something to himself, looked worriedly at his wife. She was asleep. And then he, sighing with relief, quietly left the room. Dorothy sat up, odd. Where did her husband go in the middle of the night? After thinking for a moment, she found a box of matches and, within seconds, lit a candle. The woman got up, put on a warm robe over her pajamas, pocketed the matches, and followed her husband, thinking he headed to the kitchen. However, to her surprise, she realized Barry had turned in a completely different direction. The door leading to Leslie's room creaked almost imperceptibly. Dorothy instantly blew out the candle and approached her door. Holding her breath, she listened to her husband's quiet voice. How did you find me, Leslie? Why? I promised you. There's no need to rush events. I'll tell Dorothy everything myself. Sorry. I couldn't resist. I just wanted to see your family. See how you live. Silly. You'll know everything soon. I can't tell Dorothy everything now. It wouldn't be fair on my part. You understand. But I've been waiting for so long. I... I have more rights to you than she does. Leslie, stay with me for a while. Please. A shiver ran down Dorothy's body. She had already reached out to open the door, but suddenly changed her mind. She didn't want to look foolish. Of course, she was young and beautiful. Could Dorothy compete with her? The woman suddenly remembered how Barry and Leslie exchanged glances during dinner. How could Dorothy have not paid attention to it? Barry, the man she had lived with for so many years, her beloved husband. How could he do this to her? Dorothy returned to her room and lay down in bed. She looked at the clock. Time seemed to have stopped for her. What should she do? Barry would come back from this girl soon. Lie in the same bed with Dorothy. Maybe even hug her. A wave of disgust surged through her. She heard her powerless, offended thoughts. Dear God, why? Why? Dorothy asked herself. The decision came naturally. She would not stay under the roof of this traitor. She would leave. She would remember the way. It's not difficult. After all, this Leslie somehow managed to find their house. So Dorothy would manage to. She didn't want to wake her sons. Why disturb their sleep? They would find out everything soon enough. What will happen to us now? How do we go on? Dorothy feverishly thought as she got dressed. When the preparations were complete, she quietly went to the back door and walked away from the house, not noticing the figure following her, barely audible footsteps. Dorothy quickly lost her way. In the daylight, the path seemed simple and clear. But now, in the darkness, amid the silent snow, the road was completely indistinguishable. Feeling tiredness and dizziness, she stumbled into drifts covered with a thick icy crust. The wind howled incessantly. Finally, Dorothy stopped to catch her breath. In that moment, she heard the nearby crunch of snow. Turning around, she couldn't discern anything in the surroundings. Dorothy moved forward, and suddenly, the ground opened beneath her feet. With a mournful cry, she plummeted down. Hey, Dad. Nick shook his father's shoulder. Why are you sleeping here in the living room? Ha! Huh? What? Barry didn't immediately grasp where he was and what he was being asked. I'm asking. Why are you sleeping here? What time is it? Barry answered a question with a question again, 
giving himself time to come up with a suitable excuse. It's almost nine. Where is everyone? I don't know. Nick replied. They're probably still sleeping. So why are you here? The older son didn't give up. Well, I couldn't sleep for a long time at night. Tossing and turning. Didn't want to disturb mom. That's how. Barry finally answered. In short, I decided to come here. Have a stronger drink. S80 here, thinking about various things. You know they're suggesting I run for city council. That's what I was thinking about here. Well, then I didn't notice when I fell asleep. What's the matter? Why does it bother you? Nick sat down next to his father. It's just mom's birthday. And I wouldn't want her to be upset. Barry smirked. Hmm. Have you decided that we had a fight? In response, Nick shrugged and looked away confusedly. Barry knew that expression on his face. It meant one thing. Nick was worried. So it was time to help him get rid of unpleasant thoughts. Son, you know mom and I never quarrel. I won't allow myself to hurt her on such a day. I know. Dad, Nick said and fell silent. And once again, his father understood him. Well, son, do you have any problems with Brooke? I don't know what's happening to her. Her mood keeps changing constantly. To say that I'm tired is an understatement. You know, I'm starting to think more and more that she needs help from doctors. A psychologist or a psychiatrist. I don't really understand the specifics of these professions. But I can definitely say that we can't get through this on our own, Dad. Well, if she behaves like that, son, it means something doesn't suit her in your relationship, right? Try to think and analyze. Maybe you make mistakes somewhere without realizing them. Dad, I'm extremely attentive to her. Nick shrugged. Let her speak. Listen to her patiently, with understanding. Don't interrupt or argue your point. Just listen. It's important for women to be understood. Understand. Okay. I'll try. Nodded Nick. After all, I love her. And I want Brooke to be happy. By the way, the reason I came down here. I haven't seen Brooke in the room. Have you seen her, son? Until you woke me up. I was sleeping and only dreaming. Get dressed. Go outside. Maybe she went for a work while you were asleep. Go to her and talk to her. Nick searched the entire area around the house but found no sign of his wife. And there were no traces to follow. However, there was no need to be surprised. The snow was covering the surroundings with soft fluffy flakes. Nick returned to the house with nothing. Still not feeling worried about his wife. After all, where could she have gone from here? Maybe she went to Molly's or to her mother. Meanwhile, Barry had already tidied himself up and was now brewing coffee. Well, didn't find her. He asked. No. Nick shook his head. Now he was getting worried. I'll go upstairs. Take a look there. I'll also check with mom. Maybe she saw her. On the stairs, Nick ran into Todd. Where's mom? Todd asked his father and older brother. I knocked. No one answered. The door is open. The room is a mess. The bed isn't made. And mom is not there. It's not like her. Why are you silent? Barry frowned. Nick quickly ran upstairs and went through all the rooms. He found neither his wife nor his mother. Grabbing his phone, he cursed immediately. The mobile was dead. Nick rushed downstairs. Dad, mom and Brooke are missing. Nowhere to be found. Todd took his brother's words as a failed joke. I wonder where they could have gone at night. Especially in such weather. Barry turned to his younger son. Todd, where's Molly? Todd didn't understand anything. She's changing. And she'll be down here soon. What's going on at all? Are you joking? Can someone explain anything to me at all? Does anyone have a charged phone? Nick grabbed Todd's hand. Todd, where's yours? Here. Take it. Todd handed him the phone, and Nick quickly dialed his mother's number. A slight buzzing on the shelf drove the men to despair. Dorothy had left her phone at home. Nick called his wife. Brooke's phone was turned off. All right. Let's search the house again. Barry suggested. 
getting up, and then check the area around the house again. Boys, I'm sure there's no reason to worry. The door to Leslie's room creaked open, sleepily, like a little girl. She rubbed her eyes and smiled at Barry and his sons. Good morning. It seems I overslept breakfast. Why do you all have such serious faces? Leslie, didn't you hear anything last night? Nick asked. No. The girl shook her head. What happened? Mom and my wife are missing. Leslie widened her eyes, immediately glancing at Barry as if seeking answers in his eyes. At that moment, Molly entered the living room. However, she also hadn't heard anything suspicious during the night, though she cast a puzzled look at Barry. The men circled the entire area around the house again and retained only when they were freezing. Molly prepared tea and sandwiches. So, what's up? She asked. Nothing. Todd replied. Listen, Molly, you went out at night, didn't you? You could have seen something. I didn't go anywhere, Molly replied, almost spilling hot tea. What do you mean? You even woke me up, and I asked what time it was. You said it was still night, and you were going to the kitchen for water. I offered to bring it, but you decided to go down yourself. Molly, don't be silent. I see that you know something. Now every detail can be important. Molly glanced at Barry again, and then turned her gaze to the guest. Leslie, sorry, Barry, but I won't stay silent, Molly said. I saw you coming out of Leslie's room at night. What? Todd and Nick stared at their father simultaneously. Dad, what does this mean? Leslie turned to Barry. He was pale but calm. Nothing. Tell them. Let everyone know. Barry said. Okay. Dad. Leslie nodded agreeably. Dad. Todd exclaimed. Yes, that's right. Leslie is my daughter. Barry said. I recently learned about her existence. More precisely. She told me everything, and you believed her. Nick couldn't hold back. Yes and no. Barry replied. I'm not a child who can be led by a touching story of an unhappy childhood. But Leslie looks so much like her mother. So much that when I saw her, I thought Sabrina had returned. The woman I once loved. But still, I checked Leslie's words with a DNA test. She didn't object to it. And very soon, I was convinced that she is indeed my daughter. Dad, this can't be. Todd exclaimed. What Sabrina are you talking about? I hope you can forgive me, boys. Although I don't deserve your forgiveness. Sighed Barry. It happened 23 years ago. Barry led a typical life with a family and children. He earned a decent living. Genuinely loved his wife. But felt like something was missing. Some sharpness intense emotions. He had met Dorothy back in his college days, and their relationship followed a standard pattern. The campus troublemaker fell in love with the quiet top student, committed to his studies, and won the heart of the reserved girl. Wedding, children, a quiet family life, everything was just like everyone else. Such families often became the subject of envy for those around them. Barry felt happy, but his happiness was subdued. Sometimes a man longs for storms and thunder. At that time, he worked as a translator, spoke several languages, and even independently mastered Chinese. In the company where Barry worked, he was valued and frequently sent on business trips. This time, he was supposed to go to a small town for negotiations regarding the construction of a small wallpaper manufacturing company. He settled into a cozy hotel. The negotiations went smoothly, and after signing all the contracts, a small banquet was arranged. It was there that he met Sabrina. She worked in the same company branch as Barry. He immediately noticed her among others. Sabrina had an unusual appearance, described as angelic, as if she stepped out of a painting. Slender, tall, with huge eyes, further emphasized by her short haircut. She seemed like someone to be protected from the cruel world, turning into a knight in shining armor. Dorothy had never evoked such feelings in Barry. She was down to earth, practical, and familiar. But Sabrina, 
Sabrina appeared to be otherworldly. Barry simply approached her and struck up a conversation about work. Mutual sympathy quickly developed between them. Barry was enchanted by her smile and laughter, the slightly shy gaze, and the movements of her delicate hands. Sabrina, how about escaping tonight? Barry proposed at the end of the banquet. Let's escape. Sabrina agreed. Until morning, they wandered through the streets, which seemed even cozier and more romantic. They held hands like young lovers, laughed, and chatted about nonsense. Barry realized he was hopelessly in love. She was his woman, the one he had been searching for all his life. He was ready to propose to her that very night, but he was married. They greeted the sunrise in the park, sitting on a bench, embracing each other. Barry gently touched Sabrina's hair, inhaling her sweet scent feeling like the happiest person in the world. But he couldn't hide the truth from her. Sabrina, he squeezed her hand in his. I'm married, I have children, and it seems I love you. She raised her incredible eyes to him, and he immediately drowned in them. She remained silent, gazing at him. Then she smiled. I think I love you too. And happiness, does it have to be a family thing, right? Let's just love each other and not think about anything. Barry nodded. He kissed Sabrina on the lips for the first time. Thus, their affair began. Barry called Dorothy and told her he had to extend his business trip. At work, Barry took a leave. He spent the entire week with Sabrina. They walked, went to the movies. He moved from the hotel to her small cozy apartment, where he fixed electrical outlets and a leaking faucet in the bathroom. But the week came to an end. Barry had to return to his family. As they parted, Sabrina hugged him tightly and whispered softly, Come back. Come back whenever you can. I have no one else. And I won't have anyone else. I'll be waiting for you. Barry promised he would come back. And he kept his word. He visited Sabrina twice more and both times felt like the happiest person in the world. He loved Sabrina. And he knew it was true love not just infatuation or Connell passion. He simply knew, and Sabrina loved him. However, divorce was inconceivable for him. The children were still too young. Dorothy didn't work. She became a homemaker right after receiving her diploma, all for him. Barry couldn't abandon her. He loved his wife, but his love for Dorothy was different. Not a pure, bright, immense feeling like with Sabrina but a calm, tender, soothing one. That's how it should be. But he was needed by Dorothy. Therefore, a difficult decision had to be made. Barry honestly told Sabrina about his intention. She didn't argue or try to persuade him to stay, only cried and, through tears, managed to say, just go, I'll try to forget, but I'll be waiting. Barry left, he came home, the first year after the breakup was tough for him. He constantly thought about Sabrina, yearned for her soul, dreamed of seeing her at least once, to see her, hug her, kiss her, and stay with her, forever. But he forbade himself these thoughts. And after a while, he managed to forget about the forbidden feeling, or at least he thought he did, hoping that Sabrina wouldn't be waiting for him, as she promised. Of course, the thought of another man touching her stood rage within Barry. Yet, he genuinely wished Sabrina happiness. Many years passed, and one day, a young girl approached Barry on the street and called him by name. Are you Barry? She asked. Yes. He nodded cautiously, studying her face. He had seen this beautiful girl somewhere before, or perhaps she strongly resembled someone. Do you know Sabrina? The stranger asked unexpectedly. The name emerged from the darkness of the past so unexpectedly that Barry flinched. He understood who this girl reminded him of. Yes, he knew. I'm sorry, but who are you to her? A relative? Barry inquired. The girl nodded. I'm her daughter. My name is Leslie. She added, and I'm also your daughter. It took Barry some time to comprehend everything the unfamiliar girl was telling him. After parting with Barry, Sabrina fell into a deep depression. She went to work on autopilot, fulfilled her duties, 
and at home, she lay on the couch, staring at the ceiling. Only the news of her pregnancy managed to lift her out of this state. She was expecting a child from her beloved man, and Sabrina decided that this would be the meaning of her future life. Raising a child alone is not an easy task, and Sabrina had no doubts about being a single mother. Nobody else was needed by her except Barry. She didn't want to tell him about the child. Grandma insisted that you should be involved in our lives, at least financially, Leslie told Barry. But Mom rejected those proposals. It's my child, Sabrina said, a child born out of love. I don't want to spoil his life. He has a family, and my daughter will be my family. In due time, a healthy girl was born. When Leslie turned 10, Sabrina began to feel unwell. She weakened, lost weight. Doctors diagnosed her with cancer. Mom passed away many years ago. My grandma raised me. Before her death, she told me about you and gave me your photo. Mom kept it. Do you believe me? Barry shook his head. I don't even know. But let's start with this. In any case, I'll help you settle in this city. Find an apartment assist with your studies, and help you find a job. And to dispel all doubts, both you and I will undergo a DNA test. Okay, then both of us will be sure that we are indeed related. Can I call you dad? You can. Although I won't deny it will sound very strange. Well, let it be. Tell me, will you visit me? I really want to get to know you better. I will definitely visit. Promise, I promise. He replied, Barry kindly welcomed Leslie into his life. When the DNA test confirmed their relationship, Leslie hardly noticed any changes in how he treated her. Nevertheless, they became more comfortable around each other and enjoyed spending time together. Will you ever introduce me to your family, Dad? Leslie asked one day, absolutely, but I need to prepare them first. Barry replied, Dad, do you really love me, my girl? Of course, I love you very much, and I regret not knowing about you earlier. You can't imagine how happy I am that we found each other. When will you come again? She inquired. Sorry, only next week. I'm going away with the family to the mountains, and will be back on Monday. Why are you so upset? Please, don't be. She pressed against his shoulder. You know, I'm the happiest when you're around. I'm your family. Right, of course. You're my family. However, when Barry left, Leslie pondered for a long time. Eventually, she decided to visit the same resort as her father and coincidentally meet his family. Little did she know they stayed in a private house and she actually got lost on her way there. I thought you'd be staying in an ordinary hotel and I wanted to meet you as a regular guest, but it turned out differently. I'm sorry, please forgive me. Leslie said, blushing from overwhelming emotions. Nick and Todd exchanged glances, and Barry stopped frowning. Well, maybe it's for the best, he said. For the best, Todd exclaimed. What are you talking about? Dad, Mom and Brooke are missing. Something happened to them, for sure. They need help, and you say it's for the best. I meant Leslie. The girl is not to blame and there's no need to accuse her of something she didn't do. Yes, now we need to find Dorothy and Brooke. Figure out what happened. Nick, did you try calling your wife? Yes, I tried, but her phone is unreachable. I overheard Brooke talking on the phone yesterday. Leslie hesitantly began. She said she was waiting for someone very eagerly. Who? Nick turned sharply to Leslie, startling her. What are you talking about? Who was my wife waiting for? And why? When we asked you about it, did you say you didn't know anything? I still don't know anything now. Only. Only I remembered that phrase. Leslie shook her head. Why don't you believe me? Calm down. Barry sighed. No one is accusing you of anything. If you really know or heard something, then tell us. I think I heard the sound of a depotting car. Maybe it was a snowmobile. I'm not sure, there was such wind, but I could hear the engine running. But where could mom and Brooke go? Moreover, 
in the middle of the night, with someone unknown. Nick shrugged, then turned irritably to his father. Dad, why are you silent all the time? It seems like you don't care. Ha, huh? don't talk nonsense. Barry sharply interrupted him, and in that same second, Dorothy's phone, still lying on the shelf, rang. Barry hurried to answer his wife's phone, glancing at the display, muttering to himself, Oh, just what I needed. It was Joan, Dorothy's sister. Hello, Barry said, answering the call. Dorothy, oh, Barry, is that you? Hi, let me talk to Dorothy, please. I want to congratulate her. I called yesterday evening, but there was no connection. Joan, Dorothy can't answer. She's missing. What? How is that possible? Where is she? Barry, I don't know. They went somewhere in the middle of the night with Brooke, Nick's wife. We've been searching for them and found nothing. Barry, are you out of your mind? What does the police say? We haven't called them yet. We decided to figure it out ourselves. You know, the elections are coming up soon, and I don't need all this fuss. Barry, snap out of it. Joan yelled, what elections? Something might have happened to Dorothy. Why did you drag her into these cursed mountains in the first place? She called me before leaving, worried, unsure if she should go there at all. Or have you forgotten that she barely recovered from such a trip before? So, here's the plan. I'm coming to you right now. You call the police immediately and let them search for both Dorothy and Brooke. I think they just returned to town. Barry said, and we're going back there too. We've already searched the house and the surroundings. There's nothing. After all, they're both grown women, clearly not prone to any foolishness. I still don't understand you, Joan said. I'll start searching right away. Call everyone who can help in any way. I'm asking you again. Don't make a fuss, Barry insisted. But Joan ended the call. Barry put the phone aside then looked at his sons. Well, what are you standing there for? Get ready. We're leaving. I think we should make another round. Nick objected. And you know, Dad, Joan is right. You seem suspiciously calm. What should I do? Barry exclaimed. Run around and shout. No, but you should look for Mom. Nick left the room, and Todd followed his brother. Molly went to pack while Leslie sat next to her father, who sat at the table, holding his head in his hands. Dad, understand, they're just very worried. Of course, everything is fine with Dorothy, and you're not to blame. I feel like she left me, Barry said. The only thing I don't understand is why like this. Without saying a word, in the middle of the night. Lately, I've been busy with business, the election campaign took a lot of time and energy. I didn't pay her enough attention. Maybe she found someone, and I didn't notice anything. Daddy, you, you, you're very good. Leslie continued to reassure him. Okay, I'll go help Nick and Todd. Maybe we'll find something, some clue. The man rest and headed towards the exit, but the door swung open by itself and three people entered the living room accompanied by police. Barry, a small, round police officer with bushy mustaches and a sly squint looked Barry straight in the eye. Yes, it's me. Hello, Barry greeted. You are accused of possession and distribution of prohibited substances. We will conduct a search of your personal belongings. Barry felt a chill down his spine at this statement. The man helplessly shrugged. I've never done anything like that. You must be confusing me with someone else. Nick and Todd, returning home, were bewildered when they heard what was going on. They sat silently, watching as the police searched their bags and other belongings. Why did you come here? To have a family vacation. Barry replied to the police officer. The police officer scanned those present Nick, Todd, Molly. Then, he focused his gaze on Leslie. Who else was with you? My wife Dorothy and my son's wife Brooke. Barry replied. Call them. Unfortunately, I can't. They left. Where to? And how is that relevant? Barry wondered. And, by the way, 
Why do you assume I'll answer all your questions without a lawyer? Ha! Huh. You came to this wilderness to find prohibited substances that, according to you, I brought with me. Go ahead. Search. But I assure you, there's been some mistake. After inspecting their belongings, the police proceeded to search the cars. They especially scrutinized the trunks, but found nothing. This visibly surprised them. As it seemed to Barry and everyone else, the police knew what and where to look, but had to leave empty-handed. However, upon returning to town, Nick was instructed to come to the police station to give a statement. Well, if they call me, I'll come. Barry calmly said. But keep in mind, I'll have my lawyer with me. The journey back home was long and agonizing. The mood was completely ruined. Sometimes circumstances unfold in a way that makes you drift on them like waves, not knowing which shore you'll end up on. Upon arriving home, Nick realized Brooke hadn't appeared in the apartment. He wearily sank onto the couch, clutching his phone. His wife's mobile was still turned off. Where are you, Brooke? How can I find you? Nick whispered. He understood. He needed to go to the police. But for some reason, he was very afraid to do so. The phone rang so unexpectedly that Nick jerked in fear, dropping the phone from his hands. Hello. Yes. Who is this? Nick. A quiet voice of Brooke was heard. It's me. Brooke. Are you alive? My God. Where are you? Is everything okay with you? Nick. Wait. I have very little time, but I need to tell you something very important. I did a terrible thing. Nick, tell me where you are, and I'll come. Nick said tenderly. We'll figure everything out. Brooke, we'll find out everything. Just tell me where you are and where mom is. Plunging into the abyss, Dorothy lay still for a long time, sometimes slipping into unconsciousness, then returning to the dreadful reality. She understood that there was no rescue coming from anywhere. Perhaps the time of her life was ticking not on the hours, but on the minutes. Unbearable pain pierced her entire being. She couldn't even move. Wet snow whipped against her cheeks. Her teeth chattered with such force that the vibration echoed throughout her body, intensifying the already incredible waves of pain. But then it all ended. Dorothy breathed a sigh of relief suddenly feeling like she was lying in a soft bed in that magical house, listening to the wind howling outside. She was warm, even hot. Drops of sweat appeared on her forehead, still better than the penetrating cold. Now she would close her eyes and fall asleep, and when she woke up, this nightmare would be gone. A new day would come, and everything would be fine again. Dorothy did close her eyes. Her head was spinning, Carrying her into unconsciousness, she no longer understood where the dream was and where reality. Some voices echoed, sometimes loud, sometimes soft. Dorothy, disconnected from reality, couldn't make out the words. And, frankly, she didn't care. She just didn't want anyone to touch her. She lay in a soft, floating mist. Myriads of stars spun around. Then the terrible pain returned. Dorothy screamed, trying to resist it, and a muffled unfamiliar voice kept insisting, Endure, endure a little, everything will be fine soon. Dorothy opened her eyes, the pain pierced her body through and through. She winced and groaned. It was dark. The only source of light was the window, long unwashed, dim, but still allowing her to see the surroundings. In the middle of the room stood a table, long since losing its original appearance. Near the table were two chairs, clearly from different sets, and a worn-out armchair. The color of the upholstery now only guessed. She struggled to sit up. Again, this pain. Lord, it hurts so much. For a moment, she closed her eyes and shook her head. But the pain only intensified. Dorothy tried to sit up in bed. Only now did she realize she was wearing different clothes. The chest was bandaged with bandages. Strangely enough, clean bandages. Just a few spots of dried blood. Awake. A voice inquired. She couldn't even tell if it belonged to a man or a woman. She turned around. 
The door of the house or the room where she was located was open. In the doorway stood a man, holding several logs in his hands. He entered the room and threw the wood right on the floor, near the table. Dorothy nodded in response. You've been lying for two days. I thought you might not wake up. The man smiled. You were moaning all the time. But when I saw that your cheeks turned pink and the fever subsided, I knew everything would be okay. What's your name, Dorothy? The homeowner sat down and opened a small door. Behind the door, flames flickered. He carefully inserted a log into the stove, adjusted it, and paused, gazing thoughtfully at the fire. Well, Dorothy, what brought you to that gorge? A. She closed her eyes. I don't even know. After all, she couldn't tell him that she left her husband, the traitor, in the middle of the night. What a foolish act. But back then, she didn't see it that way. And you're probably one of the vacationers. There are a couple of places around here where people constantly come in search of adventure. And you? Are you also a vacationer? No. I live here. You can call me a hermit. But I like it here. What about me? Dorothy asked the man. Well, I think you got away with multiple bruises and maybe some fractures. But don't worry. I did what I could. So, I believe you can wait for the doctors. By the way, I'm somewhat of a doctor too. A veterinarian. But if it reassures you, there aren't that many differences between animals and humans. The same bones, the same muscles, and pain is the same. Can you call a doctor? Well, only if it's tomorrow or the day after. Today, no one will get here anyway. The roads are snowed in. No off-road vehicle can pass. How did you bring me here on a sled? How did you find me? It was my dog. We were just heading home when we saw you working toward the ravine. I started shouting at you, but the wind carried my voice away. Stark ran to you. He would have reached you faster. But just before that, you fell. I think someone pushed me, Dorothy said. But the man shook his head. There was no one there, and no traces either. Maybe you just got dizzy or saw something that wasn't there. Have you heard about fear of heights? Yes, I once tried mountain climbing. Actually, it was a long time ago, and it ended badly. Dorothy smiled with difficulty. It seems the mountains are not for me. By the way, what's your name and why did you come here? Garon wondered. My name is Garon. My husband suggested taking a break rented a cottage for this purpose. I had my anniversary yesterday. Oh, congratulations. Garon genuinely exclaimed, then suddenly slapped his forehead. Wait, isn't it near the mountain stream? Yes, that place is called so. There's a two-story house with a porch, surrounded by pine trees. Yes, Dorothy nodded, but now I really don't understand how you ended up in the gorge. Dorothy, how did you find yourself there alone? Ha, huh. she frowned. I, we had a fight with my husband. I decided to leave. Garon shrugged. Well, I know that women often do foolish things, but to this extent. Dorothy, honestly, are you tired of living or something? She looked him in the eyes and suddenly burst into tears. You're a strange one, Garon said. You don't complain about anything but you cry. You just reminded me of a girl I knew a long time ago. She could cry so quietly, and it broke my heart the most. Imagine, green eyes with large tears that looked like diamonds. Dorothy smiled through her tears. You're just a poet, a poet. He smiled back. I'm just Garon. Well, never mind. I'll heat up dinner now, feed you, and you'll tell me where I can find your husband. He's probably going crazy with worry, right? Oh, I don't think so. Dorothy sadly said, he's not concerned about me. So, I'm like a deserted wife, and he doesn't need me at all. So, that's why you left in the middle of the night, huh? And Dorothy nodded, then it makes sense. But still, very foolish. Maybe you have someone you can trust, like other relatives or children. I have sons, but I don't want to involve them in my problems, you know. 
There's also my sister, Joan. By the way, you can call her. Well then, give me the number. Garon exclaimed, finding some way out of the situation. The problem is, Dorothy widened her eyes. My phone is in the house, and I don't remember the number by heart. Got it. Garon shrugged. So, our adventures with you continue. When Dorothy fell asleep, Garon quickly dressed, ordered Stark to guard the woman, and went outside to start a new snowmobile. He planned to go to Mountain Stream and figure out what had happened. However, to his surprise, there was no one in the house. I don't get it. Garon spoke, examining the tracks in the snow. So, the so-called husband did leave Dorothy and calmly drove away. And she was right. It's all strange, but I hope she'll be okay. After some more thought, he directed his snowmobile to the town where his friend Mick lived, working as a masseur at one of the local resorts. Luckily, he was at home and delighted with Garon's visit. Oh, Garon, you're just in time. I was about to have lunch. Come on, Garon, I'll treat you. Finally, I have a day off, so let's relax. Sit down, chat. You've completely turned wild in your mountains. You've even grown a huge beard. Mike, I don't have time for long conversations. I have a problem. I found a woman. She fell into the gorge. She'll live, of course. We managed to avoid frostbite, but I'm not sure about fractures. Would you check her out? Oh, come on, Garon. I'm not a surgeon. Take her to the hospital. On what? This, perhaps. Garon waved his hand towards the snowmobile. No, she needs a proper car, preferably an ambulance. But after yesterday's weather, no ambulance will reach me. There are steep and narrow turns there. Of course, she could stay with me, but I'm afraid it might get worse. Well then, there's another option. Call an ambulance. Let it go as far as it can and bring the woman down on something suitable. Well, yes. Mike, will you help? So, as far as I understand, you won't let me have lunch. The man sighed. Mike, I'll cook you dinner later. Just come with me now, and let's not be late. Go get dressed. Garon and Mick did everything right. Soon, Dorothy was brought to the hospital, where doctors indeed found several fractures and a concussion. You got off relatively easy. The doctor told her, thank your rescuers. If it weren't for them, things could have ended quite tragically for you. Dorothy forced a smile. I've heard such words before. Also after a mountain trip, can you imagine? Even more strange that you decided to test fate again. The nurse said, if I were you, I wouldn't risk my health like that. Well, never mind. Now you need to rest and recover. We'll inform your family that you're okay. Just tell us how to reach them. Can you call Garon, the man who found me and brought me here? Dorothy asked. Unfortunately, he has left. That's a pity. I never got to thank him. No worries. Once you're on your feet, we'll discharge you, and then you can find your Garon. I think he'll be glad to see you healthy. And now, rest. A few hours later, Barry, Joan, Dorothy's sister, and her sons Nick and Todd entered Dorothy's room. Dorothy, her husband rushed to her bed. How you scared us. Where were you? We were looking for you. Dorothy silently turned away from him and looked at her sister and sons. It's good that you came, she said. Mom, mommy, we were going crazy with worry. Nick and Todd spoke interrupting each other. Joan sat next to her older sister, wiping away tears. Dorothy, why didn't you call us earlier? Why didn't you let us know you were found? My phone was in the house, and unfortunately, I don't remember your numbers by heart. But now it doesn't matter. Everything will be fine. And now, please leave me with Barry. I want to talk to him. The man, who had been standing bewildered on the side all this time, approached and sat on a chair next to his wife. Dorothy, what was all that? He asked, not taking his eyes off her. I just want to know from you. Will you file for divorce 
Or should I do it when I get out of the hospital? Dorothy. Barry frowned. So, I was right after all. Someone has appeared in your life. Where did you get that idea? Dorothy raised her eyebrows. Why did you bring up divorce? Then, because someone has appeared in your life. And I mean that girl Leslie. Barry. I saw you go to her at night. I heard your passionate whispers. Barry. I would never have believed you were cheating on me if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. And she had the audacity to come to us. Barry. Why would you do this? Wasn't it good enough with me? Dorothy. You just heard what you wanted to hear. Do you mean you don't know this girl and saw her for the first time? No. I don't mean that because it would be a lie. But, Dorothy, you misunderstood everything. Leslie is my daughter, and we share normal family ties. Daughter. Dorothy's eyes widened, unsure whether to believe her husband or not. But how, Barry? And from where? Remember I told you about Sabrina? We used to work at the same company. Yes, I remember. Dorothy nodded. So, this is Sabrina. She gave birth to a daughter. From me, you understand. And I knew nothing about it. The girl was eventually raised by her grandmother. She passed away. And before dying, she told Leslie about me. But, but Barry, this is some mistake. Dorothy protested. This just can't be. It can. Dorothy. The thing is, I did a DNA test, and everything was confirmed. Then, then why didn't you tell me about her right away? I don't know. I was scared. Thought you wouldn't understand. Wanted to prepare somehow. But Leslie couldn't wait. She really wanted to meet my family. And learning that we were going to the mountains, she decided to come along. Leslie thought we would be staying at a guest house with many vacationers and planned to pretend to be a guest. I didn't tell her that I rented a private house away from everyone. I still don't understand. How could you trust her right away? Dorothy began, but Barry interrupted her. Dorothy, Leslie is my only biological child. Can't you understand how I couldn't reject her? Dad, came a voice from the door. Barry turned around and saw Nick and Todd. They stood there, not taking their eyes off their father. What do you mean? Leslie is your only biological child. What about us? Barry closed his eyes, then looked at his sons. Boys, he said, you are also my family. But I was talking about my daughter. Nick and Todd looked at their mom. Do you not want to tell us anything? Mom, Dorothy shifted her gaze to her husband. Oh, Barry. What have you done? Dorothy sighed, looked at her grown-up sons. She could tell them a lot, but why dig into the past she had buried long ago under the weight of the years? To her, it seemed like her life began the day she met Barry. Everything before him was just a series of mistakes, futile expectations, and failures she stumbled into. Nick and Todd stood by her. How different they looked from each other. Well, that was to be expected since they had different fathers. But Dorothy had never told them about it. And now she had to. But where should she start her story? Her memory began to work in its own way. Presenting her with images of her past life. She saw herself as a young girl. Parking the essential things and documents into a bag. Leaving home. She had almost no money. Just a small amount for the ticket. Dorothy bought a train ticket worked along the platform for a long time, scrutinizing the faces of people. She thought she would recognize her father in one of them, and then her dream would not come true, as jokes with her father were not welcome. Minutes felt like an eternity, and he comes, the long-awaited train. Sitting in the carriage, Dorothy looked out the window and marveled at the familiar landscape. She had been to these places a hundred times, but had never paid attention to their ugliness. I wonder how it will be there. In the big city, in the next minute, the girl dozed off. She didn't hear the wheels clatter, conversations, or someone taking her old suitcase from under her hand. What saved Dorothy was that she had put her documents in a small bag, and she used it as a pillow when she fell asleep. Otherwise, thieves would have taken everything she had. Waking up, 
Dorothy discovered the loss. She was not used to crying, and there was little benefit from it. No one would return her things. There was only one thing left, to go towards her goal. Otherwise, why did she come to this big and unwelcoming city? Dorothy spent the night at the train station and, for an entire day, survived on only two sandwiches she bought with the leftover change. In the morning, she set out to submit her documents to the college. Now she needed to find a way to survive. To avoid starving, Dorothy went to the nearest grocery market and offered her help in exchange for food. Some people took pity and agreed, and Dorothy was genuinely grateful to them. She cleaned up trash, assisted vendors in arranging their products, and sometimes received groceries as payment. She saved the money she earned. Soon, she secured a permanent job. An old woman, who traded in old books, helped her with accommodation. Time passed surprisingly fast. The city greeted Dorothy with indifference. The city lived its usual life, and here, everyone was on their own. Dorothy didn't bring anything from her past life. Now she had no relatives or friends. This allowed her to stride forward in life carefree, thoughtless, and without looking back. Dorothy excelled in her entrance exams. However, there was no one to share her joy with. She wrote letters to her parents, asking for forgiveness. She thought her mother and father would understand and support her. But unfortunately, it turned out differently. In his only letter, her father expressed all his thoughts about the rebellious daughter. Later, he disowned her, stating that Dorothy was no longer a part of the home or family. She cried all night back then, but it was too late to change anything. Besides, she didn't want to. However, Dorothy's happiness knew no bounds when she learned that she had been accepted into the college. Now she would live in the dormitory, which thrilled her even more. All that remained was to wait for the start of the academic year. However, shortly before this, an event occurred that would forever change Dorothy's life. One evening, after finishing her work shift, as she returned home, a stranger approached her. The stern face, tightly pressed lips adorned with crimson lipstick, and a menacing wrinkle between her brows spoke volumes. Mrs. Summers is in the hospital. She had a stroke. I'm her niece. You, I assume, rent a room from her. The stranger said, yes. Dorothy replied quietly, lowering her gaze to the floor. From today onwards, the room is no longer for rent. Please vacate it and leave the apartment. You have 15 minutes. I'm in a hurry. The stranger told Dorothy, pointing towards the door of her room. Once again on the street, Dorothy wandered through the alleys for a long time. Sitting on a bench in the square, she burst into tears. She didn't notice the guy who had stopped nearby. He looked at Dorothy for a long time, attentively. Suddenly, he approached, sat next to her, and said, Hello, lovely fairy. What happened to you? Hello, Dorothy said, feeling embarrassed. But I'm not a fairy. My name is Dorothy. Oh, really? The guy looked surprised. You look so much like a little fairy from a fairy tale. Don't worry. I won't harm you. I want to offer you my help. My name is Nick. As far as I understand, you have problems. Maybe I can help you with something. Dorothy looked intently at her interlocutor. There was something about him, either those bottomless blue eyes or his kind open smile. Well, tell me, what happened to you? Nick asked. Dorothy didn't understand why she suddenly decided to confide in this person. No one else had spoken to her with such warmth in their voice, showing genuine interest in her fate. She wasn't even of interest to her own parents. And here, a complete stranger and a very handsome young man indicated that she didn't have to be alone in her troubles. And Dorothy told him everything. At the end of her story, she added that she was now a student and eagerly awaited the start of the academic year to begin her studies at the college. Hearing this, Nick raised his eyebrows in amazement. This naive girl in a tattered dress was a student at one of the best universities in the city. What an absurdity. However, out loud, 
The young man said something else. Listen, Dorothy, do you have other clothes? What do you change into? The girl shrugged. No, my suitcase with clothes was stolen. But I've saved up some money to buy something new. Well, that's clear. Your parents must have disowned you. Right, they did. Sighed the girl. Okay, come with me. Nick stood up decisively. But Dorothy remained seated. Where? She asked. There's a hotel nearby. Do you have your passport with you? I do. Well, that's wonderful. I'll pay for your week's stay. And please don't argue. It's not difficult for me. I own well, but I can't. Dorothy shook her head. I don't have the money to pay you back. Who said you need to pay it back? Nick smiled. Though I'm not insisting. I'm just offering my help. If you want, let's go. If not, stay. The decision is yours. He stood there for a moment, looking at the girl, and without saying a word, walked away. Dorothy watched him go. Doubt store her soul, enveloping everything in a fog. The only person who had treated her kindly. Dorothy stood up. Without hesitation, she ran after Nick. He smiled upon hearing her hurried footsteps behind him. The man stopped and turned to the girl. There's a smart girl, a little furry. Never push away someone who wants to do you good. Thank you, she said, smiling so simply and openly that even Nick was taken aback. This girl didn't try to flirt or make an impression on him. She was herself, and he liked that a lot. Liked it the most. Well, let's go then. But first, let's stop by one more place. The young man said, that place turned out to be a store where Nick bought some groceries for Dorothy. Then they headed to the hotel, and he paid for a room for her for two weeks. Together, they entered the room, which seemed luxurious to the girl. In a surge of emotions, Dorothy threw herself onto the neck of her new acquaintance and pressed her cheek to his. I have nothing to thank you with yet, she told him. But someday, I will do something very very good for you i promise all right i'll remember that nick laughed handing her the bag of groceries well now it's time for me to go dorothy see you the farewell felt somewhat awkward and when the door closed behind nick dorothy mentally scolded herself for how she behaved for not properly thanking nick he probably thinks i'm clueless dorothy fought well never mind We'll definitely see each other again. At least, I'd like that. Dorothy washed up, laundered her only dress, and then eagerly started eating. Satisfied, she lay down on the bed. Sleep quickly overcame her, and she only opened her eyes when she heard a knock on the door. She looked at the clock and gasped. It was 11 in the morning. She had never slept so long in her life. The knock repeated. The girl jumped up, hastily threw on a hotel robe and opened the door. Nick was standing on the threshold. I thought you had run away, but you were actually sleeping. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to wake you. If I knew, I would have come later. She rubbed her eyes in a childish manner, chasing away the remnants of sleep and stepped aside. No, no, come in. I'm very glad to see you and so grateful. You just can't imagine how. And now you'll be even more grateful. Nick said solemnly, handing Dorothy a bundle. Here, take it. Peeking inside, the girl gasped. There were clothes, a couple of dresses, a blouse, pants, and a sweater. I hope I got the size right, but how? Why? Dorothy gasped with embarrassment and delight. Well, you have nothing to wear, Nick said. So this morning, I went to the store, asked the salespeople to pick out some clothes. I wanted to buy shoes too, but I didn't know your size. He expected the girl to start refusing, and he would have to persuade her to accept the clothes. But Dorothy thanked him so warmly that Nick couldn't help but smile. I'm glad you liked it. But now, excuse me, I have to go. Tell me, what can I do for you? Just keep smiling. Nick sincerely replied, and never stop believing in kindness and miracles. You're a little fairy after all. Nick left, 
but Dorothy couldn't forget his eyes. They were extraordinary and radiant. Dorothy didn't return to the market. She found another job and now cleaned floors in two small shops near the hotel. With the money she earned, she bought stationery that she might need for college. By the beginning of the academic year, she was ready. Soon, Dorothy moved into the dormitory and now shared a room with two second-year students. She hadn't seen Nick since, and she had begun to think she might never meet him again. But on the 4th of September, when she came to her next class, she froze in amazement, recognizing him as the instructor. Incredibly handsome, in a strict dark blue suit and white shirt, friendly and smiling, he was more beautiful than ever. All the girls couldn't take their eyes off him. Dorothy's heart skipped a beat, then pounded twice as fast, and she realized she was completely and irreversibly in love with Nick, the best man she had ever known. Now they saw each other every day, even though they kept it a secret from everyone. They both knew they couldn't avoid each other anymore. Forgive me, my fairy, for being so weak. You know, I resisted as much as I could, but it's beyond me. He apologized. She froze for a moment, but then, gathering herself, asked, Why are you saying this? I love you and am happy when you're around. My girl, I can't be with you all the time. Dorothy. The words were reluctantly leaving his lips. I'm married. I have two daughters. I would never betray my family if I hadn't met you on my way. I don't know how you captivated me. Maybe with your straightforwardness. Resilience, incredible will to live, the ability to be happy despite everything. I can't help it, I'm drawn to you. I want to be with you, but I don't want to hurt my family. My oldest daughter is 17, the youngest is 14. They just wouldn't understand. Dorothy stepped back from Nick. They won't find out anything. I don't claim anything, Nick. I just want to love you, understand, and I will love you always but I won't destroy your family. I'm sure you have a very good wife, and she shouldn't suffer because of us. Time passed. Nick and Dorothy didn't meet often, but when they were together, the whole world ceased to exist for them. And then something happened that Dorothy never expected. She got pregnant. Learning the news, Nick frowned. What's wrong with you, Nick? You, you've turned pale. Everything's fine. I'm just very tired. Dorothy, I have a friend who's a doctor. I'll give you the contacts. And now I have to go. Sorry, that was their last meeting. None of the students knew where Nick disappeared to and why another lecturer now conducted his lectures. Dorothy understood that something irreparable had happened. Then terrible news fell on her. Nick died in a car accident. Absurdly, prematurely depriving her of the meaning of life. And then she met Barry. The guy studied at the foreign languages faculty. Barry genuinely loved Dorothy with all his heart. And even her pregnancy didn't hinder their relationship. Barry came from a good, decent family. His father died early, and his mother raised him alone. When he entered college, his mother fell ill. The years of loneliness and hard work took their toll. But she was happy for her son, supporting him. She didn't speak ill of Dorothy, although she understood that the child wasn't Barry's. What attracted Barry to Dorothy was that she resembled his mother a lot. Barry's mother didn't see Nick. The illness proved stronger. Since then, Dorothy and Barry were together. Nick was born soon after, and later, Dorothy and Barry welcomed their son, Todd. So, I'm actually named after my father and I have a different last name. Nick chuckled. No. Barry responded seriously. I am your father. Both of you carry my last name, and it won't be any different. You, Nick, are my son just like Todd. Nick hugged his father. Todd also stepped towards them. And there they were, the three of them standing tall and beautiful before Dorothy so close-knit. Joan, forgotten by everyone, suddenly spoke well okay better tell your mother about brooke what about her dorothy asked surprised so she disappeared the same night as you didn't you know 
Joan continued. No. Dorothy looked at her husband. Barry. Where is she? Is she okay? It's a whole detective story. Barry waved his hand. One of my competitors really didn't want me to win the elections. He sent a guy who seemingly accidentally met Brooke, invited her to work as an administrator in a restaurant. But Brooke agreed, came to the interview, which went completely differently. You know what I mean. In short, Brooke slapped him, left, but they managed to take a few photos where they seemed to be kissing. Brooke didn't tell Nick anything, and it was a mistake. She was soon blackmailed with those pictures. And then they demanded her to put something in my car. Our trip happened to be perfect for that plan. The scandal could have been enormous. At night, they brought everything to Brooke and demanded that she followed the plan. But she acted boldly. She took it and then threw those packages into the abyss, turned off her phone and eventually went to the village. She was luckier than you. She didn't veer off the road. Arriving at the village, she called a taxi. All this time, Brooke stayed at a friend's place, thinking the danger still threatened us. Then she called Nick, and they came to me, and she told me everything. They indeed searched our cars and belongings, but found nothing. And one more thing. I withdrew my candidacy from the elections. I don't want my beloved family to suffer because of me. Mom, Dad didn't tell everything. Nick added, Brooke is already four months pregnant. Can you imagine? She's constantly nervous about the pregnancy, but didn't even suspect it. So you'll be a grandma soon. Well, thank God. Dorothy smiled. Finally, I'm very, very happy. A big family is wonderful. No one noticed as Barry took out his phone. Frowning, he read a message and replied shortly. Then, he glanced out the window. The city shimmered in the evening twilight. He made a choice. A choice in favor of family. His husband and son stayed a bit longer. When they left, Dorothy's sister, Joan, moved closer. How are you, Joan? The older sister asked the younger one. I regret not coming to you, sis. If I were there, nothing like that would have happened, I'm sure. And Leslie by the way, is quite a nice girl. Befriend her, Dorothy. You'll like her. Dorothy smiled in response. Joan had always been kind. She was barely 12 when she wrote to Dorothy herself. And since then, active correspondence had always taken place between the sisters. Joan would tell everything happening at home, expressing regret that Dorothy didn't visit them. When their mother passed away, Dorothy attended the funeral and their father reluctantly hugged her. Well, it seems like you're doing well. Don't leave Joan when I'm gone. Dorothy looked into his eyes. I promise. Dad. Joan was 19 when their father passed away, leaving the house to the younger daughter intentionally, excluding Dorothy from the will. Dorothy took the news calmly. Don't worry, sis. I didn't expect anything. She told Joan. I only regret that I never reconciled with our parents. But I have you, my little sister, and I love you very much. Do you believe that? I believe. Joan embraced her. You know what? Joan, come to our city. Okay. Why stay in the village? You're smart, beautiful. Barry and I will help you. You'll get a good education, find a job, and we'll find you a husband. Well, but skip the husband part. I love Garon. Joan sighed. Joan, do you still remember him? The girl nodded. I'll never forget him. You know, he was mine. The first. And I want him to be the only one. Dorothy sighed. Remembering Nick. Her first love. Somewhere deep in her heart. He continued to live. Joan looked at her with her kind, radiant eyes and seemed to understand everything. Six months later, Joan indeed moved to Dorothy and Barry and placed all the money on the table. Here, from our property together, this is half. I sold the house and split the amount in half. Barry widened his eyes and Dorothy shrugged. There was no need. I have no rights to this money. They're yours. No. Take it. 
Dorothy. Her younger sister seriously replied. I rented an apartment with my half, paying a year in advance, and do whatever you want with your money. Despite Dorothy and Bari's attempts to dissuade her, Joan insisted on her decision. The money was spent on the education of their sons. Years passed. The sisters became even closer. Joan, I, here's what I wanted to ask you. Go to my savior. Please, buy him a gift from me. Thank him for what he did. Tell him. As soon as I can, I'll come myself. Don't worry. Joan smiled. I'll do it all. Just focus on getting better, sis. And don't think about anything. Dorothy was left alone. She wearily closed her eyes. It was simply incredible how many events had unfolded in their lives in just a few days. She stared out the window, and the windows of the house opposite lit up. She thought about Leslie. She would have to ask Barry to come with her. After all, she would have to get to know this girl better. Leslie was not at fault in anything, and Dorothy would try to forgive her husband. Garon set the table for Mick as promised, waiting for him to visit. It was planned as a purely male gathering, so there were no special frills on the table. Garon surveyed the table and nodded at Stark, who settled at his owner's feet. Well, are you up for some meat? Stark, with all his demeanor, showed that he didn't mind and immediately received the coveted tasty morsels. Suddenly, the dog tensed and barked. A minute later, the sound of an approaching snowmobile could be heard. He comes, Mick. Garon said to Stark and headed towards the door to greet his friend. To his surprise, an unfamiliar woman with a backpack on her shoulders was approaching the porch. I don't get it. Garon raised an eyebrow, addressing Stark. Did she come here by herself? A woman on a snowmobile here. Pinch me. Lately, women have been showing up here too often. Joan, who had turned out to be from a distance saw a bearded man standing on the porch with an unfriendly look. A large dog, somewhat resembling its broad-shouldered owner, sat at his feet. She approached closer, raising her hands and said, I come in peace. May I? May. If in peace, nodded Garon, surprised by the beginning of the conversation. Did you get lost or something? No. If you are Garon, then I'm here for you. My name is Joan. I'm Dorothy's sister. The woman you recently saved. Ah, said Garon, smiling. Do you also need help? Joan felt irritation. For some reason, she had a different image of Garon. She thought he was older and kinder. A recluse who had lived in seclusion all his life, really venturing into the civilized world. Garon was clearly just over 40. A khaki-colored t-shirt hugged his powerful shoulders and torso. His lips stretched into a mocking smile. Joan thought about the gift she brought hand-carved chess, two thermos mugs, and a set of tools for all occasions. She believed it would all be more than appropriate, as elderly people like board games, hot tea, and tinkering with things. Now she felt incredibly foolish. What could she possibly delight this giant with? Chess, well, why are you standing? Garon's rough voice softened slightly. Come in since you're here. I'm afraid of your dog, Joan said. Don't be afraid. Stark is just like you peaceful. The absurdity of the situation amused the woman, and she stepped towards Garon. Okay, hello. Now she stood very close to the homeowner. Have we not met before? Definitely not. Joan smiled. I would remember you. And suddenly, she froze. Garon's eyes. Those eyes. She had seen them up close before. Back then, they bathed in the lake. The air was damp, and it smelled of fresh grass. And the lake was so smooth, like a mirror. You could gaze into it. Joan bit her lip, but quickly regained composure. Garon. She exhaled and shook her head as if trying to dispel a hallucination. No, it can't be. Garon, Miller, is it you? Something clicked in his head. At first, he frowned, then quietly said, Joan, she nodded. Yes, yes, it's me. It was him, exactly him, her first love. 
Suddenly, she wanted to throw herself into his arms. They stood in place, looking at each other, not understanding what to do now. Joan was the first to snap out of it. Well, will you let me in? I brought you gifts from my sister. Yes, yes, come in, please. Joan entered the house, noticing the set table. She was surprised. Was this a bachelor's dinner? It seemed Dorothy mentioned that he was unmarried and lived alone. But can such a man be lonely? A sudden suspicion pierced her, and she blushed. Of course, Garon was expecting someone. He even went out onto the porch to greet someone. And here she was. Lord, anything but this. Joan least wanted to see the woman Garon was dating. Therefore, she quickly took off her backpack and pulled out everything intended for the man. He approached and began to examine the gifts with surprise. The intimidating, huge bearded guy looked like a child, playing with the chess pieces in his hands. The tool set also surprised him. The man picked up the suitcase, whistling. Did you carry all this on yourself? He asked. It must be incredibly heavy. Joan chuckled. Well, you know women. They can do anything for men. Dorothy asked me to thank you for saving her. And now, excuse me, it's time for me to go. Joan, wait. We haven't talked about anything. Garon sighed. Let's talk another time. I don't want to disturb you, Joan said, glancing at the table. You're expecting guests. A dinner for one person doesn't look like it. Oh, that's what you mean. Well, forget it. We were indeed planning to sit down. Yes, but man to man, with Mick, a friend, he'll be glad to meet you. By the way, he thinks a woman and a snowmobile are incompatible, and you handle it so skillfully. Well, you haven't seen me on a motorcycle yet. She laughed in response. My sister was horrified when she first saw me on my Japanese two-wheeler. She almost fainted. Oh, my God. Oh, Joan. Garon laughed. So many years have passed, and you haven't changed a bit. Do you remember what I was like? Really, I remember everything. Garon smiled and took her hands in his. Especially, I remember your lips. The phone rang. Garon reluctantly let go of Joan. Yes, Mike, I'm listening. Garon, sorry, I got delayed. I won't be able to come. Some big shots showed up, demanding a masseur for themselves. Let's meet another time. Okay, tomorrow morning for sure. I'll turn off my phone. I'll come to you all day tomorrow. Mick said something else, but Garon couldn't hear him. He kissed Joan again. Then they lay in each other's arms, and Joan told him about her only failed marriage. I married Bill just because he reminded me of you. But you, you're a thousand times better. Lord, how wonderful you are. She traced her finger along Garon's cheek. Garon, you've become so stern, gloomy, the voice like an old man. Why? How have you been all this time? Well, I've lived in various ways. Also divorced, served, got injured, took a long time to recover. The doctors mistakenly told my wife that I had no legs. They mixed up the names. Can you imagine? She cried for formality, then found someone else without even visiting me once. Of course, later, I came home with medals on my legs. She ran, cried, swore love, said she made a mistake, that everyone else was to blame except her. But what's it to me? I had already made my decision. And kids? Do you have kids, Garon? Joan asked. No. My ex-wife didn't want children. She always dreamed of an easy life. She said it was too early. First, we needed to live for ourselves. I didn't insist. In short, God didn't give us children. And you, Joan, no. Joan shook her head. On the contrary, I really wanted a child. But for some reason, I couldn't get pregnant. Bill blamed me for everything. So we quickly divorced. He found a replacement for me, and I remained alone. After the divorce, I decided that marriage is not for me. Garon said thoughtfully, I wanted to go to the north, 
but my friend Mick said that there's a house for sale here and he could buy it for me at a reasonable price. So I settled here, in harsh conditions, and it's been five years already. Yes, five years of servicing local hotels as a handyman and electrician. By the way, when I saved your sister, I was returning from a job. A substation burned down. The power went out in the whole area. That's when I went to fix it. I don't know how to thank you for that, you know. He chuckled, hugged her, and kissed her, then said quite seriously, Joan, I can't believe you are mine again. Listen, I was looking for you. Yes, really. I came to the village, tried to find out anything about you, but they told me you sold the house and left forever. I didn't think I'd see you, but apparently, you are fate. Fate you can't escape from, and you, you are my fate. She smiled, a year passed. They decided to celebrate Dorothy's birthday again in the mountains, in the same place. Now Garon and Joan were supposed to join the warm company. Leslie, Brooke, and Nick with their son promised to be there. Dorothy was overjoyed about her grandson. By the way, they named the boy after his grandfather, Barry. Molly was preparing to become a mother. She was three months pregnant, and joked that by the next birthday of her mother-in-law, she would have time to be discharged from the maternity hospital. Dorothy closed the novel, reading its last lines. Don't part with your loved ones. Barry was still sleeping. The tranquil morning silently stepped through the house. Indeed, it's true. Don't part with your loved ones. Only those who have experienced parting know the real truth of these words. And they surely know what a special, refined happiness it is to wake up again next to a loved one.